<laughs> Actually, Yip did more than the lyrics. Uh, when they were, when Yip and Harold Arlen were called in to do the score of The Wizard of Oz, it was uh, Yip who had this executive experience in his electrical appliance business and also had become a show doctor. So he, he was, uh, that is when a show wasn't working, you would call somebody in and try to fix it up. He had an overview of shows and he had an executive talent. And so he was always what they called a muscle man in a show, all right? And he'd already worked uh, with Bert Lahr in, uh, in a great song, the, the Woodchopper song. And, uh, Wait a second, Bert Lahr, the lion? The lion. Uh, Bert Lahr and most of these people were from vaudeville and burlesque. And uh, Yip knew them in the 20s, but he actually worked with Bert Lahr in this uh, uh, life walk a little faster and another review um, I forget that name but uh, he and Yip and Arlen gave Bert uh, songs to sing which allowed him to satirize the uh, opera world if you want or the uh, send off of, of Rich you know and uh, so they had that relationship also Yip knew Jack Haley the Tin Woodman and uh, Yip also worked with Bobby Conley as a choreographer in the early 30s on his shows, who was also the choreographer for The Wizard of Oz. So he had a cast here with uh, Arlen, who were, you know, sort of Yip's men, you know what I mean? So when Yip went to Arthur Freed, the producer, who was too busy to work on this musical, and Mervyn Leroy had nothing to do with it practically, because this is, he had never done a musical before, so it became a vacuum in which the lyricist uh, entered because he was already to do so. Yip was always an active, you know, organizer. And so the first thing he suggested was that they integrate the music with the story, which at that time in Hollywood they usually didn't do. They'd stop the story and he'd sing a song, they'd stop the story and sing a song. To, that you integrate this. Arthur Freed accepted the idea immediately. Yip then wrote, Yip and Harold then wrote uh, the songs for the uh, 45 minutes within a 110 minute film of the Munchkin sequence and, and into the Emerald City and on their way to the um, Wicked Witch when all the songs stopped because they wouldn't let them do anymore, okay? Uh, you'll notice then the chase begins, you see. In the movie. Why wouldn't they let him do anymore? Because they didn't understand what he was doing, and they wanted a chase in there. So, uh, anyhow, Yip also wrote all the dialogue in that time, and the setup to the songs, and he also wrote the part where they give out the heart, the brains, and the nerve, because he was the final script editor. And he, there was 11 uh, screenwriters on that, and he pulled the whole thing together, wrote his own lines, and, and gave the thing a coherence and a unity, which made it a work of art. But he doesn't get credit for that. He gets lyrics by E.Y. Harburg, you see. <laughs> but nevertheless, he put his influence on the thing. And Who wrote The Wizard of Oz originally, the story? Yeah, Frank L. Baum was a, a interesting kind of maverick guy who at one point in his life was an editor of a paper in South Dakota. And this is at the time of the populist uh, revolutions or uh, revolts or whatever you want to call it in the, in the Midwest because the railroads and the and the eastern city banks absolutely dominated the life of the farmers and they couldn't get away from the debts that were accumulated from these and uh, uh, Baum set out consciously uh, to um, create an American fable so that uh, the American kids didn't have to read those German grim fairy stories where they chopped off hands and things like that. You know, he didn't like that. He wanted American fable. But it had this underlay of uh, political symbolism to it that, that the uh, farmer, uh, the scarecrow, was the farmer. Uh, he, he, he thought he was dumb, but he really wasn't. He had a brain. And the Tin Woodman was the result, was the laborer in the factories who, with uh, one accident after another, he was totally reduced to a tin man with no heart, all right, on the assembly line. And uh, the cowardly lion was uh, William Jennings Bryan, who kept trying, was a big politician at that time, promising uh, to make the world over with uh, uh, the gold standard, you know. And... Uh, 
and uh, the wicked witch was uh, uh, probably the railroads, but I'm not sure, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so it was a beautiful matchup here with Frank Baum and Yip Harburg, okay? Because in the book, the word rainbow was never once mentioned. And you can go back and look at it. I did three times. The word rainbow was never once mentioned in the book. And the book opens up the, with Dorothy on a, on a black and white world that Kansas had no color. Just read the first paragraph in it. So uh, when they got to the part uh, where they had to get the song for uh, the little girl, uh, they hadn't written it yet. They had written everything else. They hadn't written the song for Judy Garland, who was a discovery by one of uh, Yip's collaborators, Burt Lane, and nobody knew the, the wonder in her voice at that time. So they worked on this song, and at that time, Ira, Yip, uh, Larry Hart, and the, the others thought that the composers should create the music first. Now, they were both locked into, the lyricist and the composer were locked into the storyline and the character and the plot development. So uh, you, um, they both knew that at this point there was a little girl in trouble on the Kansas City uh, environment, all right, and that she yearned to get out of trouble, all right? So Yip gave uh, Harold what they call a dummy title. It's not the final title, but it's something that more or less uh, zeroes in on what the situation is all about and what uh, this little girl is going to take a journey, all right? So Yip gave him a title, I Want to Get on the Other Side of the Rainbow. Now here's what happened, and I want you to play this symphonically. <laughs> I said, my God, Harold, this is a 12-year-old girl wanting to be somewhere over the rainbow. It isn't Nelson Eddy. <laughs> and I got frightened. And I said, I don't, I, it's a, let's save it, let's save it for something else, but don't, well, let's not have it then. Well, he felt his, his, he was crestfallen as he should be. And I said, let's try again. Well, he tried for another week, tried all kinds of things, but he kept coming back to it, as he should have, and he came back, and I was worried about it, and I called Ira Gershwin over, my friend, Ira said to him, he said, can you play it a little more in a pop style, and I played with rhythm. Okay, I said, oh, well, that's great, that's fine. I said, now we have to get a title for it. I didn't know what the title was going to be. And when he had... I finally came to the thing, the way I logicalized it. I want to be somewhere on the other side of the rainbow. And I began trying to fit on the other side of the rainbow. <laughs> when he had a front phrase like... Da, 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 da. Now, if you sang E, you couldn't sing e, 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 E. You had to sing O. That's the only thing that would get out. I had to get something with O in it, see? Over the rainbow. Now, that sings beautifully, see? So the sound forced me into the word over, which was much better than on the other side. Yep, uh, all the work on it came up with this uh, incredible music.